Okay, good afternoon. Uh, it's lovely to be here at Basecamp. Uh, thank you very much for coming along to my talk. It's a pleasure to be here, and I hope you're all having as much fun as I am. Uh, I am a professor of ancient history at the University of Reading in England. Uh, so why am I here at Basecamp? Because I've used SketchUp to build a 3D model of ancient Rome as it appeared in the early 4th century AD. And here it is, rendered in Cinema 4D, this shot, flying into the city from the south. So you can already see it is a, a very large model. We might even say a massive model in the words of the title. Um, also take it out to Lumion for rendering. Here is a bit closer in. Um, you see that Lumion has nice lighting effects, nice entourage. So for closer in shots, I tend to use that now. But you can see still in the background a lot of terrain, a lot of infill buildings, a lot of trees, little animated water effects. So it's really a very substantial model. Um, if we go over to Cinema 4D, where I tend to do a lot of the assembly of the city, uh, I measured it before I came out to base camp, and I found it had 728,736 discrete objects in it, um, 204 million points. It's a very large model. Um, so this talk is about how I've got round some of the challenges that have come up for me as I've made such a large model in SketchUp. All the architectural modeling is in SketchUp for this project. I've talked about this project at Basecamp before. Some of you in the room might have heard me. This talk is more about the way that I've used the software to create a large urban model, rather than the historical scholarship behind it or the uses to which I put it at the university I work in and beyond. And I'm giving a second talk on that subject later on this afternoon at 4 o'clock. For now, I'm going to talk more about the technicalities of using SketchUp to make and manage really large models. Uh, a good question someone asked me when I was thinking about this talk is, what is it that slows down your modeling? Where are the pinch points? And I think I've now got to the point in my workflow where SketchUp performance is generally not the issue. Um, bug splats, slow working crashes, or inefficient bits of workflow. Um, for me now, the workflow pinch points are outside of SketchUp, and they're mostly in, in here, uh, involving historical scholarship and analysis of evidence and the kind of decisions I need to make as a historian or archaeologist. And I think that's where I want the bottlenecks to be. I don't want the software to be slowing me down. That's a tool for doing the job. So I hope I've got to a point where I'm fairly efficient at using it now um, by identifying and working out challenges as I've gone along. Uh, but constant learning. And I've certainly learned a whole bunch of new tricks in the last two days here, which I'm going to take back and import into the workflow. And maybe some of you in the room will know much better ways of doing the things I'm about to show you, and you can just tell me, and that would be gratefully received. Something I say when I'm giving talks as an educator about SketchUp is that it's an ideal tool for educators because it's so easy. You just pick it up and play with it. And to an extent, that, that's what I've done. And what I'm going to be showing you are some, I think, fairly simple tips or workflows uh, that help solve the challenges that arise from massive modeling. Um, and I'm assuming that people in the audience are in the same sort of position to me. Uh, perhaps some beginners, perhaps some uh, more advanced modelers, but people who are running into challenges as they make bigger models. And if there are some real experts in the audience, I'd welcome your thoughts and suggestions at the end. Uh, so I'll aim to cover a few different areas, but let me start by articulating three general principles that occurred to me as I was making the model and as I was thinking about this talk. Firstly, match modeling input to the output you want at the end. And questions under that heading I'll come back to, but they include what do you want your model to do? Right? What is the point of this model? What, what's it for? We'll think through some of that uh, in due course. Secondly, work on the model piece by piece, fairly obviously. Break it up into sub-models, separate modeling windows, but within one sub-area of the model, use layers, use groups, use file organization to control and manage what will become a very large collection of data. Uh, some of the way you break the model up under principle two, hangs off the questions you address in principle one. How do you want to break this model up to achieve the kind of outputs that you want at the end? What layers, what groups will serve those ends? And thirdly, try and get your workflow nice and smooth. Um, use pre-made content where you can. Use plugins, use hotkeys to speed up repeated tasks. Before we get to all of that, one area, of course, that can slow down uh, performance is computer size and capacity. Now, I work on Macs, so all the screenshots and menu commands and stuff in this are Mac, but the PC equivalents are the same or very similar. Um, and you can customize either operating system to, to work the way you want. So here's a piece of Rome, uh, a subunit of ancient Rome, broken up into about the maximum size I find comfortable for modeling on my machine. 
And you can see in there there's a large and relatively complex terrain model. There's a large map image draped over that terrain model. Um, there's a selection of buildings with a reasonable level of detail in windows, doors, roofs, and so on. An aqueduct at the back with lots of arches, uh, lots of curves. If you go to Windows Model Info Statistics, as you probably all know, you can get a snapshot of, of what is in this model. You see here about 1.1 million edges, 16,000 components, half a million faces. And my computer's fairly happy with that sort of size of model, though it depends a bit on the, the size of the texture files. Also in that stats window, there is a purge unused button. And if you press that periodically, it gets rid of unused stuff that's bloating your model and weighing down your computer. There's also a plugin you can get called Purge All that will delete stuff that you thought you deleted when you deleted a model, but maybe it's layers or it's textures hang around in the background. So purging regularly keeps the model size as small as possible. But however good you are at doing that and however good your computer is, you eventually get to a point where you have a slow and jaggy graphics performance. Maybe the orbit tool starts to get a bit jaggy. Um, your graphics card is struggling to render the screen. And if the model file is large, autosave can take a long time. I get a lot of that spinning beach ball on my Mac as soon as autosave. So there's stuff you can do to try and optimize performance. Right? If you go to Windows Model Info and then the rendering submenu, you can turn off anti-aliasing. It gives a poorer visual effect, but at less computing cost. Turn off stuff like shadows and fog, um, if you haven't already done that. Model in a simple visual style, like the default visual style. Rendering profiles in particular seems to slow the computer down, so you go to view edges profiles and turn them off. By all means, turn those things back on again when you want to capture a final image, but for modeling, keep it simple and light, um, as, as light as possible. The second window that I've got open down there, that one, um, is in window um, model info um, uh, OpenGL, sorry, SketchUp preferences uh, uh, OpenGL. Um, if your graphics card supports fast feedback, turn it on, or will turn it off if you prefer. The interesting box here is use maximum texture size. If you untick that box, SketchUp will cap the resolution of imported textures, I think at 1024 by 1024 pixels. So a fairly coarse image, it's okay for many purposes, but it will degrade a really large image to keep graphical performance humming along. If you tick the box, use maximum texture size, uh, it will use a much bigger version of that file. The SketchUp help site doesn't say what the actual working maximum is in SketchUp, but I think it's 4096 pixels squared, so 16 times bigger. So you can view a texture at, at that resolution in your viewport, but your actual original texture might be much, much bigger than that. I'll come back to that with my map. But it won't be doing you any good. It's a lot of megabytes, but it, you can't see the, the clarity of the pixels in your model. So that comes back to the first question. How much detail do you actually want in that texture image? Um, how well is it going to display in your modeling window? What are you actually using that level of detail for? Perhaps you could go out and save a lower res version of the texture and speed things up a bit. So. With your computer set up, checked and optimized, and some basic principles in mind, we can uh, go on to the first of these three areas that I, I want to think about. Matching input to desired output. And this covers a variety of aspects of the modeling process and the use process for the model you create. From the initial design stage, before you start clicking the mouse at all, right through to the, the finished delivery of the model in whatever format you intend. So questions you can ask yourself include what are you going to do with the finished model? What levels of accuracy and detail are needed? Those two things are not always the same. What's the audience for the model? Uh, how are they going to see it, interact with it, use it? Um, are we talking about flyovers or street level, for example? Key questions that I find really boil all that down for me are, where will you be looking at this model from? What will your point of view be? And when you're standing there, what do you want to see? And making those decisions early on help you focus your modeling effort and invest detail and time in the right places and ensure you end up with the model you, you can actually use. Not all of those aims are served by packing detail into the model, um, au contraire. Approximation is inherent in any modeling process. Right? All models are models. They reduce, they simplify, they stylize, they simulate. Very rarely do we model anything in absolute true-to-life detail, every fleck in the wallpaper, every tuft in the carpet. I mean, at some point, you're drawing a line. And the question to ask yourself is, where is the right place to draw that line in your project? Detail is expensive. It's expensive in terms of computing power. 
And it's expensive, perhaps more importantly, in terms of your time, and you're probably the most important asset for your modeling project. Um, in the time you spend adding details, no one's going to see. It can be kind of satisfying, pleasing, but it's pointless if no one's ever going to see them. So over time, I began to work this out for myself and spend modeling time where it would have the best effect on the end product. Um, sometimes it's worth consciously adding detail or information to a model to serve that goal. Sometimes it's better to take it out. I'll show you a couple of examples. Here is a work in progress view of the city of Rome. I've decided I want to be able to show different kinds of archaeological information in this sort of overhead render. I want to have this kind of full color, kind of quasi-realistic view, but I want to be able to show also which buildings we know about from firm archaeological evidence and which ones are more conjectural. There we go. So the colored ones we know about, the white ones in this view, more conjectural. To be able to generate that render, I had to go back into the model and add, in this case, layering information, depending on which category the building fell into. So that downstream in the render engine, I had the models organized into known buildings and conjectural buildings, and I could apply different texture uh, uh, goals to them. So right at the macro level, a decision about the kind of view I wanted to generate informed what I did with layers inside SketchUp. Uh, at the micro level, the more vertices and faces in a particular element, of course, the bigger the model. So when I started modeling, um, I found lovely architectural drawings, and I traced them, and I used follow me or push-pull uh, to generate things like this cornice or an entablature. Uh, if you look at the stats there, it's got about 1,000 faces. And you can't see them if you zoom out. Uh, here is a, a much simplified version of the same thing. If you kept your eye on the statistics box, you'll see the one on the right has about a third of the number of vertices as the one on the left. And really, they're practically indistinguishable. And in fact, in my actual Rome model, a lot of my entablatures are grotesquely simple, like this. Just enough relief to throw a bit of shade to get the proportions right. When you zoom out to any kind of distance, you can't tell. So overspending on beautiful architectural detail um, for this kind of view was a false investment. So marshalling the right level of detail for the kind of view that I wanted. And another good principle that you surely all know is that a lot of the detail in a view like this is in textures anyway. I'm not making millions of individual bricks. I'm using a brick texture. Same for tiles, plaster, timber. Uh, you can get a model to convey information by means other than adding geometry to it, and texturing, of course, is one way to do that. Other choices under this first heading of um, where to invest time and detail in include what downstream apps you're sending the model out to. So in my workflow now, um, I go to Cinema 4D for great big whole city renders. Uh, Cubity, I'll be talking about this a bit later on in my second talk. Cubity is a nice little tool that you can use to send bits of model out to people's mobile phones, very good for teaching, for example. But that requires lower detailed versions of the models generally. Increasingly, as you see, I'm using Lumion. Uh, that has its own needs and its own strengths, so I adapt the model when I'm sending it out there as well. Um, other uses might include Unity or Unreal Engine for VR and gaming, might include 3D printing, all of which have their own particular requirements that you want to design for early on, or at least leave a bit of headroom for. Um, I, I found, working against my own principles a little bit, that details I put into the model early on because I wanted to with no very clear idea of what they would be for actually did pay off later on. So when I started this project years ago, there was no VR. There was no games engine I could drop it into. A lot of the ground level detail, the doorways and so on, was pointless. I, I never saw it, but now I do see it when I'm inside the model in VR. So investing a bit of overhead, a bit of flexibility for things you haven't thought of yet can be worthwhile, but just do it carefully. Another area where size and scale in a model um, can quickly add up is in terrain. I'm presuming that many of you, like me, are making architectural models, city models, and there you need a big terrain um, if it's a geographically extensive project, and a big terrain has lots and lots of polys in it. And that can add weight to a model and slow down your computer a lot. Also, if you want a map, as I do, the map to cover a big terrain has to be a big image, lots of pixels, lots of megabytes, and that slows down the model too. And any kind of edit on a huge mesh like this, using something like the Smooth tool, can cause a lot of slowdown as the computer tries to pick up and work out how many points are affected, how many are not are affected, and then you do your edit, and it, it can get very slow. So the terrain and its map are what slow down my modeling most in SketchUp. Um, this is the terrain model underlying my, my city model. It's about four and a half kilometers on each side, so it's geographically quite extensive. Some immediate and kind of obvious things you can do to, to speed things up is to break it up. So the river cuts it through nicely, so I use the river as my breakpoint, and I put different bits of the terrain on different layers. 
and I can just turn them off. So get out of the viewport anything you're not actually working on at the time, and your performance speeds up um, until the point where nothing is in the viewport. So bring back something and work on that. Um, a good principle that applies to much more than terrain. Put everything on layers and turn layers off that you're not using. We'll come back to that. How do we make the terrain? I'm presuming many of you are familiar with this, but SketchUp has native tools, sandbox tools, that will draw a terrain from contours. So this is how I started. A set of contours, in this case, that represent the hills and valleys of Rome as we think they appeared 2,000 or so years ago. Uh, if you're importing contours or even drawing them for yourself, do think about making them nice and smooth. Quite often, if you zoom into a contour set, it will have lots of little ins and outs and jaggy points, which will generate messy terrain and also add a lot of weight and sometimes a lot of ugliness, frankly, to a terrain model. So it might be worth spending some time smoothing these out a bit. Um, work out how many you need. I was happy with five meter intervals. Um, there's a kind of level of approximation inherent in this process that made me feel putting in one or two meter terrain contours would sort of be a false premise that there wasn't actually that much accuracy in the model. So Five meter contours did the job for me. Um, when you're happy with your contours, you can convert them into a terrain model, draw sandbox from contours. So far, so good. We've created a terrain model fairly quickly. Much quicker, of course, if you break it up into subunits and make the terrain in those subunits. Um, but there are some features here that are going to cause us problems as we progress. One is that SketchUp's native terrain tool produces for you this kind of mesh, which is called a TIN, a triangulated irregular network, and you can see why they call it that. It's a network made of irregularly sized triangles. Some of the triangles where there's a lot of relief in the terrain are tiny. Uh, some of the triangles where we're on a flat part of the model, like the plateaus on the tops of the hills or the floodplain of the River Tiber, uh, are enormous because there's no relief there for the, the model to be describing. But the result is that the individual triangles making up the tin are gigantic. Some of them are tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of square meters. You could lose whole city blocks inside them, but they only have three vertices. So you have a very coarse level of control over a terrain of that sort. If you want to pick up a, a vertex and, and shift, you'll be moving your terrain plane through dozens of buildings at once. So it's not very easy to edit. What I wanted to do was create a regular terrain mesh with, on average, smaller units um, to make more editable terrain. And luckily you can do this. Here is a plugin from Valley called Instant Terrain. Uh, it creates a new regular terrain model with a regularly spaced grid of, of, uh, of, of edges that replaces the more random groups of triangles. You can see here I'm setting a 15 meter grid interval. I did chop several seconds of waiting out of the middle of this video just to speed it up, but it's not too slow, um, especially when you're doing it on, on little areas of terrain like this. So there we go. I've created a new terrain mesh draped over my old one, and I'm going to go in and, and delete the old one. So. Instant terrain is really designed to simplify complex terrains, but here I'm using it almost the other way around. I'm complexifying the terrain, but regularizing it, optimizing it. I'm probably adding more polygons because the, the grid mesh is smaller, but they're absolutely grid regular. Um, trial and error suggested a 15 meter grid spacing works for me. That's enough resolution to allow control around individual buildings or areas of the city, but not so much that the thing runs into millions of faces and just crashes and dies. And of course, I can mitigate the performance penalty of all those lots of polygons by putting it on layers and turning off the layers I don't want to see. So instant terrain will make a much nicer, more regular terrain grid if that's what you want. The next thing I want to do is to get a map onto it. Um, this is a crucial part of my modeling process. Maybe it is for you, I don't know. But I like to have a map actually within the model to use as a visual reference as I'm drawing new buildings, seeing how buildings relate to each other in space, how they relate to the archaeological remains in the city of Rome. In some cases, how they relate to the modern street plan of Rome um, can be useful for me as well. So I found a bunch of mapping resources that I wanted to use, and I layered them up in Photoshop and used partial transparency and aligned them all, and made myself a composite map uh, with lots and lots of rich detail in it that was going to be my baseline map for this project. Um, I also included the contours as images within this map that I'd used to build the terrain. And that was important because I want a visual reference point between the model and the map image. And in my case, the contours should align. You're going to see that and prove that the map is at the right scale and position for the terrain beneath it. So I've made the image, um, how, how to import it. It's hard to position and import an image directly onto the face of a large terrain model, in part because it's got all those thousands of separate faces that all point in different directions. So this is how I did it. 
Um, maybe you've got other methods you could tell me about, but what I decided to do was to draw a line up to a constant height from each corner of my terrain model, uh, which is what I'm doing here. And then when those lines are drawn, to join them up, and that will create a closed coplanar loop of lines which generates, of course, a face. And now I have a plane face to exactly the same dimensions and the same XY coordinates as my terrain, but it's flat. And of course that means I can very easily drag an image onto it, like my map, and I can very easily manipulate and scale and position that texture image. So there it is. Um, when uh, I've done that, um, I have what I think of as my flat map layer, and that has other uses downstream that we'll come back to. But I put it on its own layer and turn it off when I don't need it. Uh, now I've got the map in place, I want to ensure that it's the right fit. So this is where the, the contours come in. Go back to my contours, turn on my flat map layer, and then I think I've got a bit of transparency set here, and you can see what I'm doing. I'm, I'm dragging to make sure that the contour pictures in the map line up with the contour models in the model. And that's my lock to make sure that my map, there we go, is, is correctly positioned and scaled. So that everything is from, I spend a lot of time getting this right, do it once, and then downstream I'm confident that everything is geographically in the right place. Um, when we've done that, we're confident the map's in the right place. Make sure that on the flat map layer it's set to projected. There we go, right click, texture, projected. Then use the eyedropper, pick it up, drop it onto the terrain below. And there we have a map in the right place for X and Y, draped onto a terrain model that I know is, is correctly located. So we now have an editable regularized terrain model, a flat map reference layer, and an image of the map projected onto the terrain below. When you've got that done to your satisfaction, uh, what, what I've done, I put it in a group, I lock that group, right click, lock, um, and then my terrain is not going to move around. And that's useful, and I'd advise you do it in a big model, because when you're zoomed in at this level of resolution, working on a building or two, you can't see the edges of the terrain, you can't see whether you've selected it or not sometimes, and you might pick it up and move it a little tiny bit instead of picking up a building and moving it a little tiny bit. And you don't discover that for hours or days, horror. Yeah, lots of nods. And you come back, and all your buildings are a meter out of place, and it takes you a while to work out why. So if you lock the terrain, and also save a master terrain file and never touch it except as a reference point, um, you will have a, a, a reference where you know that the coordinates are true, and you know it's in the right place. Also, save successive versions of, of everything all the time, numbered, organized versions, but especially for terrain, uh, because terrain's hard to edit, and sometimes you'll do something that just makes a mess, and you want to go back to the earlier one, copy out the bit you've made a mess of, bring it in, paste in place, and you've got to, you go back to the last version to, to pick up and overlay your mistakes. I think you only have 100 error steps, undo steps, and sketch up. It's not as many as it sounds like. So far, so good. Um, but there still remains a problem. To fill a terrain this big, we need a really big map. You heard me say earlier on that in SketchUp, the maximum texture size um, caps out at about 4,096 pixels squared. If you don't check use maximum texture size, if you're trying to speed your computer up, it caps at 1024 pixels squared. Um, I told you earlier that my model is about four and a half kilometers on each side. So a 1024 pixel resolution, that's about one pixel for each four meters of modeling space, which is useless to me. Um, a lot of buildings are smaller than four meters, so I don't have the resolution there that I need to, to do accurate modeling. So I tick the use maximum texture size box, and it slows my computer down, but it gives me 16 times bigger image. But that's actually still not very good. And it took me ages to work this out. I brought in my map, did all the steps you've seen me do. It looks lovely up here from this imaginary ancient Roman helicopter. When I get down to ground level, it looks like this. It's just too coarse to be useful. Like where, where is the corner of any one of those buildings? And I, I was really puzzled because it looked lovely in Photoshop, but I could see the image file was a really fat image file. So I did some reading around on SketchUp help forums, and what seems to be happening is that SketchUp is downsampling this to its absolute maximum of 4,096 pixels. Um, what was I going to do about this? I went to Photoshop and looked at my map and checked its dimensions and saw that, in fact, it was about six times bigger than that maximum. And you can see the size of it there. So what I did was split up my map into four equally sized quadrants, and I split up my map, my, my model into four quadrants. I split up the map into four um, equally divided quadrants. Um, and I separated out those map images and I imported them separately onto each quadrant. 
And I spent some time scaling them and positioning them again. You really have to be careful with that because you want the look of it to be one seamless map, whereas in fact it's four submaps, each imported at the maximum possible size that SketchUp will deal with. Um, I painted some reso marks onto the map in Photoshop, some little crosshairs, and I used those to do the alignment. Uh, so that's a cheat. Uh, and of course, it's adding data, it's adding megabytes, it's adding big images to your model, and that will slow it down. But it's a choice I made deliberately because I wanted that level of resolution in my map. So it went from this to this. Um, and that is now good enough for me to use zoomed in to position buildings um, uh, crisply and precisely on the map. <coughs> So there's an area where we're adding size and adding weight deliberately to the model. Um, it's a deliberate choice. And again, you mitigate it by turning off all the layers with the other bits of the map you don't want. Uh, but that's a choice I made deliberately. Is that all done in the same SketchUp model, or did you do it in separate SketchUp? Um, both. So I did it all in one big model to make sure all the seams were properly corrected, and then I separated them out into separate models just because if I know it, I only wanted the east bank of the river, I only opened the east bank of the river because it's much, much smaller. Yeah? So you got the terrain from one source and the map from another. Did yeah. you have any issues where you know, maybe buildings were hanging off a cliff or anything like that? Yeah. Um, one of the things I discovered that is all published sources on ancient Rome, probably including my own, uh, differ from each other sometimes by you know, centimeters, but in some case by meters or tens of meters. And that's where, you know, I said the bottleneck in my workflow is, is my historical decision making, and that was reconciling different sources. Um, the contours and one map came together. There's a second map on top of that and a modern street map on top of that layered out. And there are some inconsistencies between them. And there I just have to make a decision. Uh, I tend to use the one with the contours in as the master model for terrain because the terrain naturally follows that map but sometimes I have to tear it out a hillside or cut into a hillside to place a building. Sure. So I've already started mentioning layering, right? The, the flat map is on a layer, different bits of the terrain are on their own layers. Um, and that brings us uh, into the second principle, which is working on the model piece by piece. And this, like the first principle of matching input and output, is true at different levels uh, and different points in the modeling process. At the smallest level, it's imperative to keep everything grouped, and you probably all know this already, so I won't dwell on it. Every building within a building, every sub-element, like a window or a door or a roof, as groups. Can't really overemphasize that one. You need to be able to move a building independently of its neighbors and the terrain. Within a building, you need to be able to select and move around elements like windows and doors. And proper grouping has downstream benefits too. If you group everything correctly, it will arrive, depending on the app you're using, in your downstream app, your rendering engine or whatever, grouped and organized in the way that you want. So you need to use groups, but that's fairly standard advice, so I won't dwell on it. Considering the advice to work on the model piece by piece at, a, at the next level up, the next kind of level of zoom out, um, you can see here that I'm, uh, I, I have the model broken up into different um, areas, different city blocks. And what I have to remember to do is when I update, say, that aqueduct in that city block, I need to go, this is now my aqueduct's master model file, my reference model for aqueducts. I've got to go out and paste it um, into that one as well. And here I'm using paste in place, which is one of my favorite SketchUp commands. Uh, I think it's an overlooked super tool. Uh, it doesn't even have its own hotkey in the default keyboard setup, poor paste in place. So for me, it's shift V. Um, I never paste anything really. I, uh, you, uh, you were saying that earlier as well. I, I paste in place um, so that you know it's in exactly the right geographical location between models. So the city block model, I alter the aqueduct over to the aqueduct's master model, paste in place. You can see it conforms to the terrain. I'm just confident it's in the right place. Um, and also, sometimes, to speed up viewport performance, and because it's easier, I'll take a building out of whatever I'm working on, open up a new window, paste in place, work on it until I'm happy with it, no clutter in the background, pick it up, paste in place back where I took it from. So um, three cheers for paste in place, shift V, use it all the time. Um, there is uh, a plugin that will do that business of updating multiple instances of a model across different model files, which is NROS Reference Manager which I only found out about yesterday, so I've not tried it. But that allows you to update the model once, and in all the other model files with a, an instance of that component in, they all update automatically, which sounds brilliant, but I've not tried it. Um, but it sounds like it would do the job for me. You've seen that I use layers uh, to organize the model, and you can see here I'm turning layers on and off. 
And you can see I've named them according to the kinds of function I want them to perform. So firmly attested buildings, unattested buildings, aqueducts, terrain, all have their own layers. And layers is a really important part of that work piece by piece principle. At least two benefits, maybe you can think of more. One, it allows you to work on massive models without killing your computer, because you just turn off the stuff that you're not interested in. Uh, it also visually speeds up the modeling process, because you don't have to wade through lots of clutter to get to the, the view you want. And then secondly, it allows us to control the display of information in the finished model, as you saw earlier with that render that had colored buildings, and then some of the buildings turned white. That was done with layering in SketchUp. Now, the right way to do this uh, is to remember to click on the radio button of the layer you want to draw in. So here, I should be drawing into the layer called Servian Walls. I never remember to do this. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm just, I have very poor layer discipline at drawing. So what I need to do quite often is go back and correct the layer that things are on. Um, you might see, if you've got very sharp eyes, in this model, the roof of this building disappeared when I turned off one of the layers. All those arches there disappeared. They, they shouldn't have done. They were on the wrong layer. So you can fix that with paste in place, right? You can take your model out, new window, paste in place, correct all the layer information, bring it back in. But you can also use a plugin called the Put On Layer plugin, um, which puts everything in a group and everything below the group in the hierarchy onto the correct layer, which is a big time save. Um, you can't do it in the entity info window uh, without, um, or you can, but you have to do every single element and every subgroup of it individually. So Put On Layer helps you with that. I, I should be, I aim to be, I just always forget. Um, so, and, and it goes wrong, so I need a, a quick fix. Uh, and put on layers does that for me. So when you say you're putting on a layer, you're generally putting it on zero with that plugin. Uh, well, you can choose. So the sub menu, I can choose which layer I want to put it on. Um, and that's a fairly new thing in the workflow for me. I used to do it by taking the building out, paste in place, delete all the layers I don't want, bring it back in. Um, this is just a bit faster but there's often multiple ways of doing the same job in SketchUp. When you're structuring your models, are you, you know, in layering, are you putting the layers on a base or you put it in the overall? Uh, overall, I, normally each, at the building level, that building belongs in one layer, and all the stuff within it should therefore be in that layer too, because... I think I asked wrong. You okay. put the layers in a group. Yeah. And have everything inside of the group layer zero, or do you do it in a group? No. Um, Everything inside the group um, should be on the same layer because the, what my layers are are different types of buildings. So I want the entire thing and all its subcomponents and faces and edges to be within the layer that belongs to aqueducts or belongs to attested buildings. Does that does that make sense? I don't know. It's like saying I have the aqueduct model, mm -hmm. the aqueduct yeah. model Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you could. Um, I tend to try and group everything at the group level and the contents beneath it as well, um, partly because of the way components work in the model, and I might have the same component belonging off to different layers at different times. Uh, but I, I found this workflow works for me. There are probably different ways of doing it, and that might be, maybe I could talk to you about that at the end. That'd be interesting. Um, so put on layer. Um, there's a workflow thing, uh, and that, and maybe your question, in fact, uh, is, is about finding the optimum workflow that suits you and your project, which is the third of these principles, maximize the efficiency of your workflow. Uh, and there's a lot you could say here. Um, start with the absolute basics, right? Make sure you have a comfortable chair. Um, you saw 204 million points in that Cinema 4D model, so that's at least 204 million mouse clicks. So make sure you have a good mouse that you like that fits under your hand. Everyone has their own preferences, their own budget. Um, some aspects are cheap and easy. You've probably heard loads of people at Basecamp say use a three-button mouse already. If, if you don't, probably no one in this room doesn't, but if you don't use a three-button mouse, please do. Um, Right-click, scrolling, very important. And I say that because I often see classrooms full of students that I'm teaching to use SketchUp trying to do it on a laptop trackpad, which is a recipe for madness and despair. So uh, use a mouse. Next level up, get familiar with mouse and keyboard working. You want to be able to fly the basic navigation and indeed the basic selection tools in SketchUp really without thinking about it, using both hands looking at the screen. So that just comes, it's like touch typing. The more you type stuff, the quicker you get at typing. Did you uh, using a 3D mouse? I did. 
um, and I have one. In fact, I've got two, and I, I like them. I don't like them as much as some people like them. I mean, I think the people that really like them just completely swear by them, and it's a really intuitive, lovely way of flying around your model. I've never quite got to that level of comfort with them, but I do, I do play with them. What I do have is a little Bluetooth touchpad, um, which I use for uh, scrolling and for zooming. Um, and I just find that like one hand, I'm left-handed, so left hand on my mouse, and when my right hand's not on the keyboard, I have it on this little touchpad, and I just find that very marginally quicker than scroll zooming. Very marginally, but in a big model, every margin adds up over tens of thousands of iterations. So if you find what works for you um, with some experiment, do. Uh, you want to try and minimize hand movement a bit, but you want to learn hotkeys, and you want to customize hotkeys, like Shift-V for paste in place. You should all use that. Um, and also, don't get too set in your ways. Like I've, in Basecamp, learned things about the alternate modes of tools that I thought I knew really well. Oh, it does that if you press Alt, okay. So play around with alternate modes and play around with, um, with, with hotkeys. Uh, and you'll find that little time savings add up in a big project to a lot. If you're getting expensive, I really like having a big screen and I like having actually two big screens. You keep lots of different palettes and windows open. Photoshop, SketchUp, Cinema 4D, you know, three different SketchUp windows. Um, it's not essential, but it's nice. Yeah, and there's 3D mice, mice that people like as well. Another principle in SketchUp as a general rule, and maybe as a general rule for life, is not to do things the hard way if you can do them the easy way. Um, so, for example, keeping everything grouped. At the time, it feels like it's a little bit of extra effort, triple click and group all the time. But actually, further downstream, you will thank your earlier self for it because it makes a lot of things massively easy. If you don't like a door or a molding or a window, you just take it out. Um, and take the group out. You don't have to heal up the hole that you've just carved in the building. Um, one example of um, uh, looking for easiness and speed um, is using components. Um, identify repeating elements or subgroups in a building and make them as SketchUp components. You probably all know this. Um, I knew that, but I didn't quite follow the logic of it through. And this is the building where I experimented with components and tried to take that as far as I could. So for a start, the entire building is symmetrical about that axis, so I only made half of it. The entire building is a component that you just copy and flip. Within the building, uh, loads of elements are components. Fairly obvious things like these little idocules down here that's just the same element repeated. Um, there's some inside the building too. Uh, but also less obvious things like if you look for lines of symmetry in a structure, you can divide along those lines and make the components. So these four light wells are actually the same model four times. When I wanted to edit just that one to put that staircase in, right click, make unique, and at the point at which it differentiates from its neighbors, there you go. This structure over the back, this is at the palaestra of the bathhouse, the outdoor exercise yard. It's symmetrical about that center axis, so I only made half of it and then flipped it. Same for all the columns, same for all the pilasters. These pilaster and entablature units in that Donical caldarium at the back, those are all components. So thinking where you see a line of symmetry, where you see a repeated element that you could save time by making it once and then repeating it um, is, is, is a time saver in the end. Another example of finding an easier way to do something. Um, I said I use my map as to, to find the footprints of new buildings and draw new buildings in, but it's very hard to draw on a topo model because you can see here the rectangle tool, the line tool, keeps trying to bind to the direction of the planes of the, the, the topographical surface. I can't draw a rectangle on here, so I don't. Um, you might remember that earlier on I set a flat map layer for other reasons up in the sky. So turn that on and go and do all your planimetric drawing um, up here on the flat map layer uh, where you can draw very easily on a planar surface and then bring it down. So this is the, the terrace of a large imperial temple building, a temple of the deified Emperor Claudius which is steps on Nero turned into a fountain building, disrespectfully. Uh, so I'm drawing uh, the footprint of that. Very easy to draw on a flat surface. I'm going to group it and move it down. As a refinement, I keep that flat map layer uh, an easily typable number of meters up in the air, so that every time I make my vertical move down, I just type 1,000 enter, and I know it will land up in about the right place. So I'll do that, and then go downstairs, and it's kind of a slow video, actually. I could do it faster than this. But move it down um, to the terrain, and then um, you work on it. And you'll see it turns into a proper terrace. It's exactly the right place, because earlier on, we, we aligned the flat map player up there to the modeling space. So that um, is a different thing <coughs> that, that slightly speeds up uh, a workflow. Um, and then you can pick up the map texture and drop it back on 
if you want that as a reference uh, into the group. And paste. There we go. Uh, drape it onto the, the topo model. Um, put it on the flat map, get it in the right place. Make sure it's a projected texture. Uh, so you right click texture projected, then I just pick it up with the eyedropper and click it onto the terrain. Yeah, projected. If you don't do that, I actually originally had a video showing all of that and I chopped it because it took a bit too long, but you end up with this horrible mosaic mess of, of map. Uh, but if it's projected, SketchUp's metaphor is projection like, like that projector. I tend to think of it as a drape, like a tablecloth, but whichever metaphor you use, that, that's what allows you to uh, project um, a texture over an irregular surface and have it fall in all the right places. So um, that flat map layer has, has other uses, and I, I keep it hanging around up there for various purposes. The final thing you can do to make your life easier is use ready-made content. Um, a lot of that, of course, is in the warehouse, uh, but be careful, because a lot of stuff in the warehouse might be great for project A, but if you're making project B, it might not be so good for you. This is totally random. I, I don't mean to critique this particular model of a kitchen sink that I'm about to employ. If you made it and you're in the room, it's a lovely model. It's just not quite what I was looking for here. So you get some info on this screen, which I might have read about how big it was, but I, let's say I didn't read that information, and I bring it into my model. It's a nice, elegant model of a sink, but if you go in and look at it closely, gosh, there's a lot of detail in there, right? If you look, if I turn on hidden edges, uh, all those corner facets, all the facets in that spiral hose, wow. So choose wisely if you're bringing stuff in from the warehouse, and um, if you don't like that sink and take it out, purge afterwards to get rid of all the hidden stuff that will otherwise linger in your model and bloat it. In terms of ready-made content, if you're making like I am a city, but you're making a contemporary city, real-world city, there's loads of tools that you can get that will cut your workload down dramatically. You can buy ready-made content. You can use specialist procedural tools like City Engine, parametric and real-world SketchUp plugins like Modeler and Placemaker that will just allow you to acquire auto-generate city content and, and do what I did for ancient Rome, but instantly for New York or Melbourne or London. I can't do that because I'm making a city that doesn't exist anymore um, and also spoil the fun. But what I can do is make my own homemade component and texture library, as I think of it. Um, so I save that as a separate model, and in there I keep um, all of the things I use again and again, doorways, windows, canopies, textures that I like. Uh, you can see other things in there like fountains and planting features. Um, that helps, um, it speeds things, up, excuse me, speeds things up dramatically, make once, reuse often. And over time you can see I've added different sorts of doorway and different sorts of column in there. The aim was to have enough variety so that the finished model looks convincingly varied, but enough similarity to keep the modeling overhead fairly low and also to build up a sort of consistent family likeness look to the finished city that reflects some of the um, elements and materials that really were used in ancient Rome. If you're at um, Anders and Felix's talk earlier about their city model, similar principle to their arboretum of trees. Like you make yourself a reference library of stuff you're going to use often and then cut and paste into your model. And you can see on the right, I'm fairly swiftly making a Roman insular apartment building um, using this uh, library of ready-made components. I use this all the time. There are millions, probably, of windows in my model, but I've only made those windows, you know, half a dozen window types, and I just reuse them. I did. Well spotted. And I'll, if I had a t-shirt, Canon, I would... Um, uh, I will come onto that now. Um, there are a bunch of plugins that you can use to speed up work enormously, and I'm not... Uh, yeah, some are free, some are paid for, I'll just show you some of the ones that I use a lot. Valley Architects plugins I think are superb. This one is called Instant Roof. It makes roofs instantly. Um, there we go. So you click on a horizontal surface, select a roof type, press make roof. Uh, these are fairly simple ones, but it also does complex ones. You can see when I texture them, um, all the tiles flow in the right directions. That alone has saved me days and weeks of modeling time. Similar is Instant Fence. That makes fences instantly. Um, so I start with the group, um, select my fence type, uh, fiddle around with as many parameters as you want to. It's very, very editable. Uh, I'm just adding some, some wood textures there. There we go. And if we go and look at that fence now, you'll see that um, it conforms to the terrain. It goes uphill and downhill. All the textures are correct. Uh, it comes with a huge library of, of fence types and railing types, and you can add as many more as you want by customizing it. Here is Instant Wall. You can probably guess what Instant Wall does. Um, so the front and backyard of this Roman house are now 
uh, properly bounded by a fence and a wall. You can see also the wall there it sits perfectly on that complex terrain model. All the textures work. Um, so it's just those three tools are brilliant. Here's a much, much simpler free tool that I also use all the time called um, uh, Extrude Along Path, which is like a souped up version of Follow Me, and it just allows me to put a little molding to cast a bit of shadow all the way around a building. So um, Extrude Along Path. Um, it's very, you select the path. I have a hotkey, my down arrow. Um, you select a, a distance you want the overhang to be, and it just ping. Um, so if you're doing like a lip all the way around a building, something like that. There are other plugins I use too. I use uh, Fredo Scale and Fredo's tools a lot. Tools on surface is lovely. You can draw on a curved surface, a really complex curve, including a terrain model. You can push-pull into a curved surface uh, with joint push-pull. Um, so there are some wonderful plugins that speed up some of the basic drawing operations very well. Yeah. I didn't have to do the drape. I, that's something I drew directly on the top of the surface. So I see where I want my rail to go. It doesn't have to be touching it. it, it if it kind of you know, cuts under the train and pokes back up again, doesn't matter. The tool will identify where the surface is and drop the fence to it, or if you want, below it or above it, or any combination. Uh, so really, really powerful um, extension of the native drawing set to do stuff. I mean, 608,000, whatever it was, buildings in my model, if I had to make all the roofs by hand, I'd still be here, or not here, I'd still be at home making roofs. So um, these things really do speed life up. So uh, to conclude, making a massive scale model can be a real challenge, of course. Uh, challenges are fun, but the challenge is to the performance of your computer, your powers of organization, and methodical working, and probably for most of you, like for me, the constraint in the end is your time. How much time do you have to throw into this project? Some thought invested at the beginning about the uses you want to put your project to will help you shape model input to match that desired output and will really pay dividends later on, being an organized modeler. The metaphor I use with my students is that you can pick up a guitar or down at a piano and after a couple of hours you can kind of get a tune out of it. But if you spend six months learning your scales properly, you'll be a much better pianist later on. Same thing with this, if you invest a bit of discipline earlier on, um, the results will speak for themselves. So too is subdividing the model. So too, finding out efficient workflows and tools um, to, to maximize uh, the gain for your time and also maximize the fun, right? Nobody likes the frustrating spinning beach ball, the bug splat, um, the fact that you have to wait for your model to do things when you orbit. Um, so working smart uh, tends to mean working fun as well. And these massive models can bring lost worlds to life, like in my case, or maybe in yours, create new future landscapes for people to enjoy. So good luck and have fun, and thank you very much for listening. Uh, very happy for questions. Someone at the back so, has one. The thing I, I didn't understand is uh, you, you break this model up yeah. into many different models, and then uh, you bring it together and yeah. put it all together. So I, I, do, I, have, I, have, I have a model that's not nearly that big. It's a, it's a college campus. When I go to insert, I have to go away for 30, 40 times an hour. Yeah. Yes, if I tried to do it all in SketchUp, it would be. And there are times when I want to grab a big element and paste it into the model, and there I have to wait for the spinning beach ball. Not quite that long, but, but for a long time. Um, but beyond a certain point of size and complexity, SketchUp just won't handle the model. So when I'm working on the entire city, it tends to be in something like Cinema 4D or Lumion now. If I want to work on a bit of the city, if I'm only interested that day in visualizing a particular corner of it, I can just open up that area in SketchUp and work on that. But for assembly at a city scale, and for rendering at a city scale, I tend to go outside of SketchUp now to other tools. Uh, but SketchUp can hold a really big model. I kind of, I keep my subunits actually well below the performance threshold where the software would start to chug because I just don't want to wait for it to, to slow down. Um, but when I test the boundaries of what it will achieve, I can get quite a lot of Rome into SketchUp all at one time, but it, in the end it will start to slow down. because I'm not a good enough modeler in Cinema 4D for it to work, and the workflow I have um, kind of built up uh, heedlessly. I started in SketchUp because it was free. I was a graduate student, and it was really easy to use, and no one was training me, and I got so far into it that that's just what I like using for modeling. I could do, and they would in some ways be more efficient and more elegant models, um, 
But the good thing about not having done that is that SketchUp talks beautifully to loads of different sorts of, there's a whole ecosystem now. So having SketchUp as the center point of a, like a, an ecosystem of different apps actually works very well for me now. Yeah. Not every last building in Rome, but a lot of the big monuments, yes. Uh, and you can go inside them. And you know, I said earlier on about leaving an, like an overhead of extra detail without knowing what it was going to be for. Um, it turned out it was for walking around in Unity uh, in VR. It's great for that. Um, that didn't exist when I started making all those interiors. There were little staircases that I made without really knowing why, and I can now walk up them, so it's great. Um, but generally, I would advise my younger self not to throw in pointless detail. It's just in some cases, it's, it's worked out really well. Uh, sorry? Uh, no, um, the interiors, I mean, I make, I, I tend not to have different versions of each building, so they're all in the, the SketchUp original, yeah. Uh, in the particular slice of the city I showed you, I don't think there were any, but yeah, the big buildings like the Pantheon, the bathhouses, the Colosseum, you can go inside and walk around. Uh, um, the question was, have I found scenes to be useful in managing? Yes, but I don't use them very much. Um, my workflows, groups, and layers, when I'm teaching um, uh, SketchUp to my university students, they don't have expensive rendering engines to drop them into. So I say one way you can generate a presentation, for example, from your model is using scenes. And so as a presentational tool, I teach it. I know it can also be an organizational tool. Happens not to be the way that I work, but I've seen some people use it very effectively for organizing a model. Yeah. Um, when you're working in Lumion, combining the massive parts of yeah. the city, uh, I mean, there's no place in Lumion. Do you struggle to align them and the origin points? Uh, yeah, um, there is a way that Lumion does that, and it took me some time to find it out. Um, you can, somewhere in one of the, the tool menu, there's a little sub thing called a line, and that aligns everything in that particular layer, or whatever Lumion calls it. Um, uh, to the same X, Y, Z coordinates. So what I tend to do is bring the terrain in, and then I align everything to the terrain, and you, you can do it. Uh, there is no paste in place, but if you use that align tool, um, that's, that's what does that for you. I've got a few minutes left for questions. Yeah. Mm, no, no, maybe you could tell me how that would... Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Well, that would be really nice. I mean, part of my challenge with that is I'm I'm modeling stuff out of my imagination or kind of historical judgment anyway, or maybe those two things are the same. So there's no, um, uh, there's no existing information to bring in and use. Um, there is sometimes about where a ruin is sitting within the city, uh, but that would be worth exploring. The, the thing that I haven't really got worked out yet is proper metadata. I'd really like these models to have metadata that would include geolocation, but might also include stuff about evidential types and you know, references to archeological reports and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, that would be great. Yeah. So maybe I should look into that. Would be a good. Uh, I might catch you at the end and ask you more about that. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. I would really like to do that, and I was starting to speak to these guys because they've just printed out a 3D city model. Um, it's not made for that, so they're not proper solids, but I'd like to take a bit of Rome, like an interesting bit, let's say the area around the Colosseum. I mean, it's all interesting, but you know what I mean, and, and print that up as a sample. So I asked them um, how much their, their beautiful city model cost, and it, it's several thousand dollars to print it in this lovely resin with all the colors, but I actually have um, access to a, an acrylic 3D printer back at work at the university, and I've made individual little bits, and that works pretty nicely. Um, so it's something I'd like to do more of. I don't know what I would then do with it, right? Because there are physical models of Rome. Um, there's a whole city scale one that would fill the floor plate of this room. It's a beautiful thing. It's in Rome in a museum. The museum is shut for lack of funds and has been for years. So these things become 
in the end, you, know, they, you need to maintain them and look after them. And I, I find digital is more. I mean, I can just kind of carry it around in here. But I would like to do some 3D printing, yes. Any more? I'm going to let you go to your next session. Yeah, one at the back. When you say you do it on the Mac, are you doing it on the laptop? No. Um, I've got an 8-core Mac Pro at home. Um, I also have a PC for Lumion because Lumion doesn't run on the Mac. Um, so, yeah, I have, I have a, a bigger Mac Pro. But I, don't, I think I could. I mean, on this trip, I've been opening... Bits on this laptop and it's fine. Parts. Yeah, parts of it, yeah. The rendering I do on the desktop. Okay, time to let you go. Thank you very much for coming.